So tonight, um, welcome along and really grateful that you've spent some time with us tonight to hear a little bit about the Alpine Fault, which for most of you, you'll be aware that it's one of the most significant faults that we have in the South Island. And tonight I'm going to talk a bit about why we need to be thinking about the Alpine Fault, maybe a bit concerned about the fault and what it might do in future in terms of generating an earthquake that might affect large parts of the South Island. And then later on, once I've finished doing a bit of a science um, spiel, we'll talk with, with Ewan and then we'll open up for, for Q&A about the emergency management arrangements for your area here in the Waitaki and in Omaru as well because I'm sure you'll have some questions about that. So we'll have lots and lots of time at the end for questions and please feel free to stay as long as you like. We won't be going anywhere, although we do have a dinner booking down the road at about 8.30, but we're fine. Um, <laughs> so the way that I, I tend to do these, um, these presentations is, is starting off with just what I call a bit of Geology 101, which is a way to share some of the, the reasons why New Zealand has you know, high seismic risk. Um, so why is that? Okay, so let's step out into a global scale in, to, to understand the setting that we, we live in in New Zealand and the big global picture of what we call tectonics or the way the plates um, interact around the globe. And so here, these little fly spots that you're seeing sort of crisscrossing all, all around the planet mark the position of um, plate boundaries where these big tectonic plates meet. And it's the, at those boundaries where we have a lot of... Um, activity in terms of earthquakes and volcanoes. That's where things are really happening uh, in terms of seismicity and volcanic activity. And so, um, for example, uh, zooming in now to the Pacific Rim, so this is the Ring of Fire you might have heard of, um, that makes its way all around the Pacific Rim here, shown, shown in that orange colour. Now that's where about 80-85% of all of the world's earthquakes and volcanic volcanoes actually exist. So this is a very busy place. Um, so it's, it's a, a plate that's interfacing or, or connected to a number of other large tectonic plates around that, that boundary. And for us down here in the South Pacific, we have the Pacific plate and the Australian plate meeting. And shown on the right of the slide here, you can see that white line. That's the position of that plate boundary as it makes its way right through New Zealand. And so you can see it, it's um, off the coast of the North Island out to the east. And then it makes its way just south of Wellington, cutting across the South Island and then going off uh, the coast again at about Milford Sound. So if you think about that in a slightly different way, in a more three-dimensional way, you can, you can see here um, basically New Zealand sliced into two or three different pieces. And in the North Island, you might be able to tell there that the Pacific Plate is actually what we call subducting or diving down underneath the, the North Island. So I'll show you that with the laser. You can see it there, it's moving down. As that plate dives down under the North Island, it gets to a certain depth, it starts to cook up a little bit, there's a bit of temperature and pressure there. And that's where we see that melting of, of the, the plate as it descends and the rising up of magma, which causes our volcanic um, area through the central North Island. That's why we have uh, Lake Taupo, um, Ruapehu and all the other volcanics right through the central North Island. And then we have this other subduction zone off the southwest coast of the South Island here. And it's actually um, moving in the opposite direction. So this time we have the Australian plate out to the west diving down under the South Island. And then in between we have a big linking fault or, or we call a transform fault. That's the Alpine fault and also some of the area through the, the Marlborough um, region, which links those two big subduction zones together. So it's a very complex and very interesting tectonic environment that we live on in New Zealand. And it's reflected here in what we call the National Seismic Hazard Model. So this shows us where our biggest earthquake hazards are, where the, the faults are that are likely to cause um, damaging earthquakes for us in future. And so you can see here the warmer kind of orange and red colours showing the most significant um, hazard for us in terms of seismicity. And unsurprisingly, that maps straight on to where the plate boundary is. So going right up from Fiordland and up on the, off the east coast, that's where our highest um, hazard areas are. So what does that mean for New Zealand in terms of earthquakes going back in time? And of course, New Zealand's experienced earthquakes for millions of years um, and 
before uh, the sort of arrival of Europeans, of course, there were many examples of earthquakes going back in time. But if we just go back to, this, to 1840, there have been several really significant, significant earthquakes for us in New Zealand. And the first and largest of those, well, not the first, but one of the most significant was the Wairarapa earthquake in 1855. And that, was, that still remains the, the largest earthquake that we have on the historical record. Um, that one was um, obviously around the Wellington region and it caused significant movement of the landscape, which actually helped scientists at the time understand that earthquakes produced big shifts in the ground and on the landscape. And that was the very first time anywhere in the world that that had, had, had been recorded. So New Zealand really was a, quite a groundbreaking kind of natural laboratory for earthquake science back in those days. Then um, fast forward a few decades, 1931, this is an earthquake that most of us will remember or, or at least know of, the, um, the, the Napier earthquake. And it, it took place at a time where we were having a sort of a cluster of earthquakes. You can see a number of red stars here. And sorry, I didn't explain that up on the, the left of the chart here, this is magnitude greater than seven. So only the earthquakes bigger than seven on our, on our seismic record. And this is the date going along from 1840 to the present time on the right of the slide. So around the 1920s, 30s and into the 40s, we had this cluster of earthquakes. And it was at that stage that uh, our Earthquake Commission, which at the time was known as the Earthquake and War Damages Commission, was set up because we were experiencing these damaging earthquakes we were also experiencing a world war and we didn't have the resources to build back the way we'd like to. And so the Earthquake Commission um, began as a, a basically a national insurance um, agency for, for New Zealand to help us to recover from these inevitable earthquakes that we were continuing to experience. 1968, the Anangahua earthquake. Again, many of you might remember this one. Uh, it affected uh, the Upper South Island. It was very damaging to places like Murchison. Um, it killed a, a number of people. And then there was this period of around 40 years where we had no significant earthquakes. Uh, and I would argue that that was a, a time in New Zealand's history where uh, we became really complacent about earthquake risk in this country. We, we didn't think, you know, a couple of generations almost had gone by and we hadn't um, a, a living memory of earthquakes. So things kicked off again in about 20, 2003, there was a significant earthquake down in Tiano and then Resolution Island in 2009, which again, you may not have heard of, but that was um, a, a, a very large, you know, magnitude 7.8 earthquake. It affected Tiano, but because it was in Fiordland, um, there, wasn't many, there weren't many reports of damage. Then, of course, the beginning of the Canterbury earthquake um, sequence in 2000, uh, sorry, 2010, the Darfield earthquake, um, a magnitude 7.1, and you'll notice that the, the very destructive and deadly earthquake um, aftershock in February 2011 doesn't actually feature on this chart because it was a 6.3 in magnitude, but because it was so shallow, um, it did so much damage to, to, to Christchurch. And then Kaikoura in 2016. So we have this history of earthquakes going back some time and over the last 10 or 15 years we've had an absolutely real experience of these disasters which has taught us a lot. There's been a lot of investment in emergency management and in the science around earthquakes since then. So we're very fortunate that we've got this incredible um, legacy of work that's going on now that's really helping us to be better prepared for the future. So the Alpine Fault, that's what we're here to talk about tonight. And um, this little animation will help to show you exactly where it is. So the Alpine Fault itself begins just off the south coast near Milford Sound, um, and it makes its way all the way up the western side of the Southern Alps uh, until it reaches about Springs Junction where it branches off into a number of other faults through the Marlborough Fault System, the Hope Fault and others as it makes its way northward towards Wellington. This is all part of the plate boundary. So, um, so this is the, uh, the most spectacular, one of the most spectacular straight lines anywhere in the world. You can see it from a satellite and it's quite a beautiful thing to behold. So what do we know about the, the way the fault has behaved in the past? So this, this guy, um, Harold Wellman, was a scientist uh, back in the 1940s and 50s. He spent a lot of time on the west coast um, mineral sort of gold prospecting um, and mapping the landscape and he observed this very obviously very distinct 
change in topography. So, you know, you, on the west coast, you've got your very flat, kind of coastal, narrow coastal strip, and then mountains. And that in itself was a, a, a sign to him that there was something significant going on in this landscape. And he could also observe some of the, the sort of linear features, I guess, through the, through the mountains where the fault goes through there. And so he proposed this long fault, and he called it the Alpine Fault in the late 1940s. But at that time, it was, um, it was very controversial. Um, you know, the science, uh, science fraternity, as it was then, didn't understand about plate tectonics. They didn't realize that the plates were moving around. They had this theory called continental drift, and that was where we were at but in the 1940s and 50s. So what he was suggesting was, uh, you know, really outside the square, and he really did drive this, um, this conversation about landscape change, uh, earth faults occurring on, uh, earthquakes occurring on faults, moving and shifting the landscape. Um, and he went further than that. He, he observed some rocks in the, in the landscape, and it's shown here in blue, this blue color. This is a, a particular, quite a distinctive rock type called um, the Dun Mountain Ophiolite Belt. And it's also called the Red Hills because these particular rocks are, are very high in some minerals that make them quite red in colour. So he mapped this, uh, this rock type in South Westland and then he observed the same rock up in uh, Northwest Nelson. So here uh, you, can, you can see the same rock popping up again at the top there. And he proposed that these very distinctive rocks had, had at one stage been right across the, the, the fault from each other but had been moved apart successively over millions of years by earthquakes on the Alpine Fault. So you can just imagine how um, that ruffled the feathers of these traditional uh, geology um, theories and views on how things worked. And of course, with time, he was proven correct and it was incredible um, thinking outside the square at the time. So here are the Red Hills. On the right, you can see the, Tas the, the Red Hills up in Tasman. And on the left, yeah, you can see the Red Hills here. They don't grow much vegetation on them because of their, their mineralogy. So incredible, incredible science. And the story of the Alpine Fault as, as sort of revealed by Harold Wellman is really quite exciting. So here's um, that straight line through the, the, through the landscape I was just telling you about. This is a satellite map looking um, basically from Fiordland up towards Wellington. And you can see at the very top and bottom little red blobs that's marking the position of the Alpine Fault. And so what we have here are these two major tectonic uh, plates interacting and the red arrows are showing you how they're moving against each other. So on the right, you've got the Pacific plate coming in slightly uh, obliquely, slightly uh, um, squidging together the Southern Alps. It's moving and squashing the South Island, uh, you know, across the middle essentially. And that's lifting up the Southern Alps at a rate of about 10 millimetres a year of vertical movement and about 35 to 40 millimetres of horizontal movement, which is about the rate that your fingernails grow. So we're talking about very slow movement, but of course, um, over millions of years, the, these, are, these are processes that are happening along across geological time, that amount of movement does start to add up. The only problem is the Alpine Fault isn't creeping along at about that rate. It's locked, it's locked up currently, it's not moving at all. Um, and essentially what that means is that the, the plates are locked up and there's energy building. And this, this rate of about 40 millimetres a year is accumulating and it's building pressure and at some point it's going to break in the form of an earthquake. And that's when we'll get our next um, Alpine Fault earthquake at some point in the future. So how do we know the way, uh, how do we understand how the, the earthquake, the, the Alpine Fault has behaved in the past, and there are various pieces of evidence that we can use to sort of piece that together. So tree rings, for example, um, on, the, on the left of screen, um, this, this was a technique that was used to help us um, reveal the most recent earthquake on the fault, which took place in 1717 AD. And tree rings tell that story because when trees are shaken during an earthquake, it disturbs their root system and they have a slow growth year. And when you can uh, sort of do uh, analyze enough trees right up and down the west coast, you can start to paint this picture of there being quite a large forest disturbance at that particular time. And then there are other things like um, on the right, upper right, you've got what looks like just a paddock. And yeah, it does look just like a paddock, but it's actually showing an uplifted terrace uh, where the alpine fold has lifted up part of that, um, part of that field there. 
And then lower right, you've got Rob Langridge, who's a colleague of ours from GNS Science, digging a trench across the fault, because we know where the fault goes, but normally it's buried under lots of trees or under pasture. So if you, if you dig a trench across the fault, you can observe what's happening under, the, under there and you can actually sample some, um, some trees or leaves and date, uh, date um, past earthquakes. So there's another piece of really incredible evidence that was collected from the southern end of the fault near, near Haast, in fact south of Haast, at two sites, John O'Groats and Hukuri Creek. Now this was done in um, about 2011, 2012, by a team from Genius Science, where, um, uh, so they were building this picture based on what we knew there um, for, at the time. So these three little blobs on the upper right hand screen, they are the, the earthquakes that we knew about before this science was done. And at the top of the screen, that's the present day and we're going back 8,000 years along to the left. And um, these are little earthquakes, it's showing the date of the earthquakes going back in time. So when they reached, uh, when they went to this place called Hukuri Creek, um, it's basically just a creek running out of, the, out of the hills. We're looking up towards the north here. Um, the creek runs out of there, uh, out of um, the hills, and it goes and drains down into Lake Makero on a good day. But when there's an Alpine, Alpine Fold earthquake, there's a little bit of uplift and movement, and that dams up the creek as it comes out there. And that ponding of water um, then collects a whole lot of <coughs> silt and twigs and, and, start, and material that's coming down out of the hills. It, it basically collects that up. And for whatever reason, it was preserved here in this particular site. And basically there's a, a very long record of sediments that have been laid down by these big earthquakes over time. And you can see the stripes here on the left of the screen, the orange, and, sorry, the brown and gray kind of stripes of sediment. Those are showing sort of what we'd call a pulse of sediment coming out through the, the hills when, when they're shaken and there are lots of landslides, etc. And so again, you can radiocarbon date material here, and that's now painting this picture of a very long record of earthquakes going back over time. So now we have these 28 earthquakes um, over the over the, the past 8,000 years, which we um, would uh, suggest are alpine fold earthquakes. I mean, the first thing you notice probably looking at this is that these earthquakes are happening regularly through time. There are no big sort of gaps in between. They're sort of you know, coming along at quite regular intervals. And that's true. Um, the, sh the shortest time in between these events is about 140 years, and the longest is about 510. So we have um, an average of somewhere between sort of 260 and 300 years between these earthquakes going through time. Um, more recently, some re other really cool science was done which helps to s confirm what we know from the, this, this site that I've just described. And this was done by a colleague, Jamie Howarth. It was published a couple of years ago in one of the top journals in the, in the whole world. And it was basically looking at, again at these sediments that are uh, um, laid down during earthquakes, but actually this time from lakes. And so we have these four lakes um, on the west coast, very close into the Alpine Fault. And again, when, when there's shaking in the hills and, and materials coming down, it sort of goes into these lakes and accumulates down at the bottom of the lake. And so Jamie goes out with his, his coring thing, a big corer thing, and he drills down into the bottom of the lake and um, produces these cores, um, showing again these stripes of sediment. Uh, and again, being able to um, extract bits of carbonaceous material, you can then date those and basically, uh, yeah, confirming what we knew from the dates already. So one thing that did change, and so, so again, we're, we're seeing this very long history of earthquakes on the fault. We know that they are, we can see that they're happening regularly through time, and there's really no reason why they should stop happening. Um, with that average recurrence interval of around 300 years. The last one now confirmed is happening in 1717. And so what that means is that we can calculate a probability of the next um, earthquake happening. And based on Jamie's work and that previous science, we're looking at a 75% probability of the earthquake happening in the next 50 years, which is the highest um, probability of any known uh, fault in any, anywhere in New Zealand currently. Um, that puts it within the lifetimes of many New Zealanders today. And that's why we're here with AF8 having these conversations because there's a bit of urgency around us as a nation getting better prepared. And that means not just civil defence and government, but it means us in our communities, in our own homes, 
and with the people around us so that we can uh, work out how to work together, collaborate, um, and make sure that we're all as well prepared as we can to, to deal with this when it happens. So how do we do that? How do we uh, build this collective resilience? And I think a lot of it is around awareness and knowledge. So if we can have a really good idea of how it might affect us in our, in our communities, then we're, um, we're in a better position to, to work together and to, to get better prepared. And of course, with the Alpine Fault, you know, this is just one particular event that might happen. We, we see all around the country in the last decade or so, these you know, severe storms. We've seen it with Gabrielle, we've seen it in Auckland. Essentially, if you're getting prepared for an Alpine Fault earthquake, you're also getting prepared for a number of other things that could happen and probably will happen in future. And so, you know, it's not just about earthquake preparedness. It's about disruption and about working together for any type of event that might affect us in the future. So what is, what is AF8? So AF8 stands for Alpine Fault Magnitude 8, and it's a, it's a collaboration between scientists, emergency managers, uh, we call you know, civil defence and emergency management. There are six of those groups around the South Island, and you can see them on the map on the right. So there are six SEDEM groups, as we call them, and each of them has a group manager, and they sit on our steering group, and they helped, and, and we all worked together to build AF8 back in 2016. The initial uh, goal of AF8 was to build a response plan so that all of those six SEDEM groups could work together um, when this event happens and be more effective and coordinated in how they did things. And we've achieved, we achieved that. In the first two years, we built what we call the SAFER framework, uh, which helps all of those groups to, to work together. But it's also about communities and, and these sorts of conversations that we try and have and we get out on the roadshow and to build awareness, etc. So that's, that's part of why we're here tonight. And um, it's really a nice collaboration between the science community. We've had heaps of really great support and investment from a team of scientists across, across the country, um, policymakers, and people actually working at the coal face of emergency um, services and civil defence and all of the partner agencies that have a role to play in responding to an event like this. So it's been a really great collaboration. So you're probably wondering, what is this going to be like? You know, how's the South Point Fault going to behave? What does it mean for us here and across the South Island? And before I launch into a bit more detail on that, I just want to get a couple of key terms quite clear because there's often a bit of confusion between magnitude and the intensity of an earthquake. So just a, a couple, couple of key points here. The magnitude of an earthquake is the amount of energy that it releases at the epicenter. So when an earthquake begins, we call it the epicenter and, it, and the um, energy then radiates out from that point. That's, that's the magnitude, that helps us to calculate the magnitude of the earthquake. And it's measured on a magnitude scale from one right up to 10, but because it's what we call a logarithmic scale, it starts to kind of saturate out at the very highest um, numbers. So you never get a magnitude 10 earthquake. Um, the largest earthquake ever recorded was a 9.6 over in Chile. So that's the largest one that we've ever had. Um, so that's um, each, it, it, the log, log scale means that each step up that um, magnitude scale gets much more seismic energy. In fact, every 0.2 of an increment is doubling the energy that's produced by an earthquake. So you might remember uh, the Kaikoura earthquake was a magnitude 7.8, and the Alpine Fold earthquake, if it's around an eight, that's double the amount of seismic energy, which is quite, you know, it's quite interesting to think about the scale like that. And the damage tends to be worse around what I'm calling the rupture zone. That's where the earthquake happens and it breaks, the fault actually breaks right through to the surface. So you see um, some cracks or some movements on one side might go up a bit or down. That's what we call surface rupture. Intensity, on the other hand, is more about how we experience the earthquake where we are. So that means how much stuff wobbles around in my house, maybe I get liquefaction in the garden. Um, that tells us how intense the shaking was and the damage that that earthquake of magnitude eight, or whatever it is, will do in my location. So it's really location specific. And it's measured on the modified Macaulay scale, and you've probably heard that mentioned. It goes from one right up to 12, and 12 is where you get very much, a lot of destruction and one is fairly perceptible. 
Um, the damage is related to your distance from the epicenter. So it's very much where you happen to be located or your bridge or your road, etc. So as part of AFA, we, um, we needed something to go on in terms of um, painting a picture of what this future earthquake might be like. And so we used the best science available back in 2016 about the intensity of shaking that we would likely experience from this, this scenario earthquake. So this we describe as the north to south rupture scenario. It's just one particular way that the Alpine Fault might behave on the day. Now these colours, sort of red to yellows to greens, are the intensity scale and you can see that down on the bottom right hand corner. So going right up to 10, the orange and red colours and you can see in this particular scenario the earthquake is starting at that white blob up in sort of around Greymouth and it's pushing a lot of its seismic energy away from that epicenter and it's pushing it down towards uh, the southwest, towards Fiordland. And this is what I would call the footprint of shaking uh, or intensity that you might experience in that particular scenario. Now it took a massive supercomputer to generate this and actually there's a guy in the room tonight who helped with that, he's a data crunching guy. Um, <laughs> we were just chatting earlier. So yeah, it takes a lot of um, computer energy to generate these sorts of models. Then we had another one called the central rupture scenario. So this is where the earthquake begins in the sort of uh, glaciers and it pushes the energy out in both directions. And you can see it produces a different footprint of shaking. So again, we're seeing most of the shaking and, and damage on the west coast, um, but you can also see that this is a South Island wide event. You're getting um, intensities that will be very much felt right across the South Island. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. This is the third scenario, and this is the one that we use to inform our planning. So this was considered the most credible scientifically in terms of the earthquake um, epicenter being down in M Milford Sound or around that area. Um, and it also had the most potential to cause headaches for civil defense. So there's more population up in the upper South Island. You can see most of more um, intense shaking up in that part of the, the island. So this is the one that we use to inform the response planning that we did from there. So this is an animation showing you how that sort of plays out kind of in reality, but of course this is a scenario. So you can see some little, um, some spikes starting to emerge down in Fiordland. This is where the earthquake is beginning around Milford Sound. Now this is vertically exaggerated, so you're not going to get shaking of that intensely across the South Island. But um, it shows you how those seismic waves start to radiate out from the epicenter. And you can see the most intense shaking, those, those larger peaks where the shaking is more significant, is moving up the west coast you can see some of them, if you can look closely, you can see some radiating out towards us here in Omeroo and Dunedin and Invercargill. And the time ticking away here, so we're now a minute and a half into this earthquake and the shaking is progressing now up into the Canterbury uh, Plains and up through uh, the glaciers, etc. as this m makes its way northward. Interesting things happening in Canterbury. So um, under Canterbury, you might remember there are deep sediments. This is a... Um, an area that's been um, laid down by rivers, braided rivers coming out of the mountains over thousands of years. So there's a lot of deep sediment and, and gravel underneath Canterbury. Now those um, sediments tend to um, act a bit like jelly on a plate when it comes to shaking. They wobble around for quite a bit after that. The main wave front's now heading up towards um, Nelson and through the Marlborough uh, Fault area and into the North Island. And it will travel across Cook Strait and be felt in the lower North Island as well. In fact, highly likely to be felt right across the country. So that sort of, it's quite um, confronting to see that and I'm sure many of you will be thinking, gosh, you know, this is, this is big. Um, and it takes time for an earthquake like this to roll out across a big long fault. And I think that's a really important thing for us to, to remember here. Um, so what does that mean in terms of um, our infrastructure, our communities and the damage that it might cause? So here on the left of screen, you can see the South Island um, State Highway Network. Let's start with roads because, of course, um, roads don't like being heavily shaken. And you can see some images on the right there of some of the damage that we might, like, we might expect. Anywhere uh, the, the fault cuts across bridges or roads or communities, that's where you're going to get the most significant damage because when this fault moves, there's a likely um, horizontal movement of something like 10 metres of horizontal movement. 
and one or two metres of vertical movement as well. So anything that's sitting across that fault as the rupture moves up to the surface is going to be quite badly disrupted. And so you can see, particularly on the west coast, the highway network, there are lots of orange and red colours that's showing where the, 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 the ground is moving and shaking the most. So we're going to get the most damage on that in those parts of the highway network. So that's State Highway 6. Also, all of the alpine passes that go from across to the west coast, you know, the Buller Gorge, um, Arthur's Pass, Haast Pass, and also the Milford Road. So those areas are going to be really badly affected. Um, the bridges, uh, Waka Kotahi, the New Zealand Transport Agency, is working on uh, building resilience into their bridge network, but highly likely that West Coast bridges will be damaged to some extent. It might just be that the approaches onto the bridges are impassable for a while, but it could actually be structural damage to the bridge itself. So it's likely that communities, particularly on the West Coast, might be isolated between bridges um, until they can be checked and, um, and that sort of thing. So we're, we're concerned about um, the West Coast, particularly South Westland, areas that are quite a long way away from um, from Greymouth and Hokitika because getting access back to those communities is going to take quite a bit of time. What about other things? So we're talking about shaking and of course that's what we always think about when we think about earthquakes, you know, that the minutes of, of shaking and then it stops and then we start feeling aftershocks and all that sort of thing. But there are other earthquake hazards that we need to bear in mind as well. So once the earthquakes stop, the earthquakes, you know, the shaking stops, the other things are triggered by that shaking. And so here's an example of what we would call a, a secondary hazard um, cascade, when one thing then leads to another and another. So here's an earthquake and then particularly on the, in the Alpine region of the Southern Alps, we get a lot of landslides that are likely to come down. Those landslides might cross a river and impound or dam the river in behind it. So you get that, the lake or quake lake forming in behind these landslides at times. And often those dams are, are fairly, um, uh, what's the word, uh, they, can, they can actually not last that long, they can fail quite quickly and we can sometimes have the, the water um, going downstream and sort of a dam break flood, which can cause obviously that's high risk for communities or people downstream of these things. So that's one particular concern and actually we, we saw a lot of that in the Kaikoura earthquake where um, there were a number of really uh, significant landslide dams that were being monitored closely because they were a threat to people and infrastructure downstream. So yeah, I mentioned aftershocks, there are others like tsunami for example where the, an earthquake generates um, a wave uh, and we need to be concerned about those. Actually not so much in the, um, the Alpine Faults case because as I noted it's all mainly on land. To, to generate a tsunami you need the seafloor to be t displaced or moved which generates the tsunami, um, but it does go offshore just at the mouth of Milford Sound, so there is a significant potential for there to be a tsunami that's produced at the very southern end of the fault there. The other thing for us in the Southern Alps area is rocks falling into lakes or um, into the, the, the Milford Sound, for example, which can plunge down into the lake uh, and generate a sort of a, what we call a, a, um, a rockfall tsunami that can be quite significant as well. So that's the highway network, um, and then uh, here we have, um, that's caused by land shake, landslide, sorry, we just looked at land, uh, shaking on the highway network, and now we're looking at landslides on the highway network, sorry. Um, and so we've got this model, this is a model of landslides where they're likely to happen across uh, the South Island, and the orange colours are where we've got a very high likelihood of landslides and then you again overlay the highway network and you can see where the hotspots are again for landslides affecting the, the roads. And, and again, you know, the west coast through the Alpine passes are all highly likely to have um, some issues with landslide damage. And this again is landslides, but this time with the electricity network and you can see a really significant um, problem area for us is Arthur's Pass to get power across to the west coast uh, if anyone's driven through Arthur's Pass, you can you know that it's very um, unstable. The pylons that go through there are quite likely to be damaged, and to get in there and repair those is going to be really significant, particularly when you've got aftershocks rolling around, etc. Um, telecommunications, we rely so heavily, don't we, in the modern world to um, communicate with people um, on social media or, or you know emails, etc. And of course. 
there will, there will be a period of time where that won't be possible and so we need to use other ways of communicating. And there's a lot of work going on amongst um, civil defence trying to come up with alternative communications that uh, we can use. For example, on the west coast, we were on the roadshow there a couple of weeks ago. Um, each of those communities has got a Starlink um, that's just been given to them, to, to mean, meaning that they can then stay connected um, when they have some sort of um, uh, you know, significant issue in future. And of course people, so this is an image of the Kaikoura earthquake and the response to that where 1,200 people were stuck in the town uh, they were being housed and looked after at the local marae. Um, about many of them were staying there. And then after a period of two or three days, it really gets quite hard to look after visitors. And so the evacuation took them either by helicopter or actually via the Navy, uh, Navy vessel off the coast, took them down to Christchurch on the boat. So it's really important to get tourists out of towns. And as I mentioned before, you know, we've, we're going to have pockets of isolated communities, particularly around the West Coast. So we need to be thinking about how they, well, they need to be thinking about how, how they'll look after each other and look after others that might be stuck in their town for a period of time as well. So um, what about Omaru? And um, yeah, beautiful, beautiful picture here. I did a piece of work up um, in town um, with some engineers a few years ago, actually, and uh, this, this picture at the bottom is what they call photogrammetry. It's showing the streetscape of your beautiful um, heritage precinct. And so, um, so in terms of the scenario, so we're looking here at the, the south, what we call the south to north rupture, that one that we use to inform the planning. Um, you can see that here we're sitting basically on the, the uh, intensity sort of four to five, <coughs> mostly sitting in the intensity five kind of um, area on the map. And just as an example, here's the north to south, and it's very similar. You can see a bit of bit more yellow, but more of that intensity six sort of arcing round into the Waitaki Valley. But mostly speaking, in terms of this scenario, and of course it might be very different on the day, um, around that sort of intensity five um, is what you're looking at. So what does that mean? What is intensity five? So, and you won't be able to read this at the back, so I'll just say I'll just speak it to you. This is what is defined as an intensity five um, level of, of shaking. So people will feel it outside and, by, and it'll be felt by almost everyone indoors. Uh, most sleepers will be awakened and a few people will feel alarmed. Uh, what about the fittings and interiors of buildings? So small and unstable objects are displaced or upset. Some glassware and crockery might be broken. Hanging pictures knock against the wall. Opening doors might swing. Covered doors um, might open and pendulum clocks. Who's got a pendulum clock? <laughs> um, may stop. <laughs> That's a problem. Um, or change rate. Oh my God, the time might be wrong. That's, um, okay, and then structures. So type one uh, structural damage to some windows. Type one windows might be cracked. I don't know what a type one window is. I should have done my homework on that, sorry. And a few earthenware uh, where toilet fixtures might be cracked. So I'm not sure about you, but I find that quite reassuring in terms of being in this community. It's, it's feeling pretty manageable. You're, you're definitely gonna feel the shaking. There, there might be some things and items in your house that move around and break or fall over, and that's easy to mitigate that kind of risk. You can do what it suggests in the Earthquake Commission um, guidance, which some of you might have picked up, and it's, there's lots of information online. Um, the EQC has lots of great um, public education things that you can read up on, a lot of that kind of risk can be mitigated. You can look after your, your valuables and things by just securing them to the wall, etc. So um, the, the, the issue for Omaru, and it's like for many parts of the southern part of, of the South Island in this particular scenario, is not the direct impacts that you'll experience, but actually the indirect consequences of an earthquake like this. Because there is going to be serious damage across other major parts of the South Island, and um, that's going to disrupt things like the supply chain, you know, the, the movement of goods, the movement of people are getting around, and the, the road network is going to look very different for a period of time. I mean, have a think about the, the Cyclone Gabriel damage to the road network. It's going to take many months to restore um, access to some of those communities. And that's, that's what we're facing here. Uh, down the west coast, across the Alpine passes, it'll be months if not years before some of those roads are put back in. So, you know, the indirect consequences of this earthquake are what we need to be thinking about and how you can support 
yourselves, your community, but at, perhaps family that are living elsewhere or um, other, other um, ways that you can contribute to, to the recovery. So that, I hope, helps to, to reassure you that Omaru, in the, in, the, in the case of the Alpine Folders, is in reasonably good shape. That's not to say that there, there, might, there are other um, active faults in the district, um, but they have much, much longer times between earthquakes. So we know that there are other faults up the valley a little bit further. Um, if you have any particular questions about that, I have a colleague um, from Environment Canterbury here tonight who's actually done a lot of, uh, she has much better knowledge than me on those things. But um, suffice to say that other faults are able to produce earthquakes, but they occur on the sort of thousands of, of years um, time frame rather than this very short time between earthquakes on the Alpine Fault. So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to hand over to Ewan, who is your local emergency management officer. And he's going to tell you a little bit about some of the things that are happening in your district. And then after that, we're just going to open up to as many questions as you'd like to ask and um, yes, I look forward to hearing what you have to, what, what you would like to know more about. So, Ewan. Yeah, big thank you to Carolyn and um, a big thank you to Waitaki District Council for hosting this. Um, I don't want to detract from what may become as questions, but um, Carolyn's already uh, uh, alluded to look at the current events that have happened up in North Island with the anniversary week in Auckland and then Gabriel. So we're not just confined to an Alpine fault rupture for a, suffering an adverse event in this district. So I'd encourage everybody to take this What Would You Do booklet. I mean, it's a starting point as I've up on the front desk there of just information about what to do for different adverse events. So one of the first things to be aware of is just that self-preparedness. Look after yourself, your family, then your extended family, and then it just grows out from there to your communities. Um, and like I said, I don't want to preempt any questions that might come, but there's opportunities for um, discussion with me or to the panel or me later after this meeting to discuss how we can, as a community, get ourselves prepared better. Um, one other thing I want to mention is we hosted a business continuity workshop at the end of March. It was quite well received here in Waitaki. And would love to know if there's uh, interest in hosting another one. Um, if, if you're interested in a business continuity, whether it's in a small business or a larger business or in Waitaki, grab one of my cards, I've got a business card at the front there you can grab, and email me your interest in such an event on the necessity and the need to have good business continuity planning, how to go about doing business continuity, and if there's interest, we'd love to host another one. So it's something we'd like to do. Um, so like I said, I don't want to preempt any questions that might come, so I think we'll just open up to the floor. And... Yeah, there are two microphones, so if you have a question, when you have a question, uh, just raise your hand and one of our runners will come and deliver a microphone to you. While we're doing that, I'll just mention that the presentation has been videoed and Alana was going to be taking some photos that may include people in the crowd. She's there waving her hand. If anyone's got any objections of being in a photo that might end up in, in Facebook and you could just let Alana know so that we can retract that photo. Come and talk to me afterwards or I want to help. Perfect. It is on. It is on. Um, I'm not very good at phrasing questions, but has there any sort of thought around the dams that we have up our valley and how um, an earthquake would affect those dams and the effects to those at the bottom of the dams. <laughs> Look, absolutely. Look, I can, I'll introduce Brent Wilson. Brent Wilson's here from Meridian, and he's far more qualified than me to answer any question you may have regarding to the, the assets that they manage up at um, Meridian. Pass on the mic. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, my name's Brent. Uh, that's a great question. So, in an alpine fault scenario, um, we'll, we'll start right back. Of all our large hydraulic structures that we have, and it starts right up at Lake Pukaki, and then goes right down the Waitaki Valley, with Waitaki Power Station being the one closest to um, this community. Uh, we look at what the what we expect to have the peak ground accelerations at each of those sites. So, we talked about intensity before. So what would we see on that site? And we come up with a, a realistic scenario for that. Now, 
All of our large hydraulic structures, we run a program of work that looks at what would be the maximum credible earthquake that you'd likely see at that place. So that's really big earthquakes and the largest um, maximum probable flood. So there are our two concerns, is earthquake and flood. And then we subject that structure to a lot of analysis uh, to work out how that structure would behave. So, for an example, um, for the uh, Lake Pukaki, where the high dam is, uh, we expect peak ground accelerations under an alpine fault scenario to be in the order of 0.22 g. So, ground acceleration and its relative to gravity. Our maximum credible earthquake is actually released the Osler Fault, and we've subjected the Pukaki structure through modelling to a peak ground acceleration of 1.39 g. So all of our structures, um, they will be damaged under a maximum credible earthquake. There's no getting away from that. Um, but we do not expect to have any uncontrolled release of water. So we don't expect to be putting populations downstream of those large structures at risk. So if we just peel it back to the Alpine Fault, um, I talked about the maximum credible earthquake at Lake Bukaki is um, the Osler Fault. It's about a one in thirteen, uh, sorry, one in three thousand year uh, return period. Uh, the Alpine Fault is sitting down at point two two g, so quite um, uh, lower orders of magnitude. And when we get close to this community um, at Waitaki Power Station, um, we expect the Alpine. I mean, the Alpine Fault is now one hundred and forty kilometres away from Waitaki Power Station and we expect the peak ground acceleration there to be in the order of 0.08 g. Really, really low. But we've done the analysis on that structure for the maximum credible earthquake, which is the Waitangi Alahamoko Fault, has a return period of about 1 in 13,000 years. That's what we expect to be the maximum credible earthquake at that site. And that has um, peak ground accelerations in the order of about 1.4 g. So Alpine Fault point zero is point zero 0.08 G, maximum credible, which we've subject to that structure to about 1.4 G, so quite a significant difference there. Uh, hopefully uh, that answers that question. I'm so pleased you were here, Brent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to write those numbers down because I get asked that all the time, so that is excellent information. Thank you so much. No problem. Can I just, while you're talking about generation then, so... If structures are damaged, you'd stop generating. So our power network feeds off Lake Waitaki. We would have no electricity down here. Yeah, I think um, after an Alpine fault scenario, uh, you have to have the expectation you're not going to have power. And you're not going to have it for days, weeks, possibly months in some more of those rural communities that are on spur lines. Um, so under an Alpine Fault scenario, um, uh, we expect the Oho chain, Oho A, B and C power stations to be impacted um, from a generational impact for up to two years. So that's quite significant. So the way that we get water down the chain is we spill water out of where Lake Pukaki is down the spillway structure. We water up the old uh, Pukaki River which is generally dry and that feeds into Lake Benmore. And then all the water coming from Lake Pukaki ends up in Lake Benmore. And then we, um, we really have to have a really resilient Benmore, Aethermore and Waitaki, that, our lower Waitaki stations. So if you don't know, we're doing a major seismic upgrade of the penstocks at Benmore at the moment. We think they could be vulnerable under a, um, an Alpine fault scenario. So we're spending about $17 million strengthening up those penstocks, shifting it from a and we think damage inception of around about the one in 300 year event to lifting that up to a one in two and a half thousand year uh, event. So I'm trying to make it really resilient. So to sort of to answer your question, um, generation will be impacted. Um, it may not just be us guys, the generators. I think um, there was a slide there around transmission network, uh, the, the power lines, the, uh, the pylons, the lattice powers. Um, they're going to be subjected to um, a lot of shaking and damage. So we might have um, our generators all ready to go, but we still have to have the network to get that energy to your front door. So there's a lot of work around that. But yeah, um, our, our Alpine Fault scenario situation is 
uh, significant damage on the Oho chain, diverting water into Lake Benmore and making sure that we've got a really resilient um, uh, Benmore power station, um, AUMore and Waitaki, and being able to feed that into the grid. Thank you very much for your um, presentation. It was very good, and thanks to Meridian um, for their update. Just a couple of questions. Um, if the Osler fault was, was lying dormant and the, um, the Alpine fault kicked off, would that trigger the Osler fault? Yeah, I guess dormant isn't quite the right word because it is an act, it is still classified as an active fault, so it's on the, the active fault data, database for um, New Zealand. Um, we often get asked about triggering of earthquakes on different structures, so it is it is possible that the Alpine fault will trigger earthquakes on um, nearby earthquake uh, uh, near, nearby faults, and in fact other parts of the plate boundary. But the risk of that is very, very low. So we often get asked, oh, could the Alpine Fault trigger uh, something on the Marlborough Fault system or the Hikarangi margin, which is that big subduction zone off the east coast of the North Island? And I've asked science colleagues about this, and, and it's not impossible, but the risk of that happening is incredibly low. Um, so what we might find is that aftershocks happen on local faults near the, the main you know, Alpine Fault itself, the, the triggering smaller aftershocks locally, but the, the idea of a major event triggering another major event up the plate boundaries is, is not impossible but very low probability. Yeah. Just one, one last question um, which was brought up from our Meridian uh, representative. If we're going to be without power up and down the valley for a considerable amount of time, yeah. Um, we've discussed it locally in Amarama where we have the, um, the community centre. Uh, we want a three-phase power system so that we can feed a generator into there mm -hmm. and act as a refugee centre because if we've got tourists, we've got uh, Alps to Ocean people and so on, yeah. in any of the towns up and down the valley, mm -hmm. they're going to need a base to go to to survive or to get tri <coughs> triage treatment, whatever. Um, what is the council doing to strengthen these community centres, not necessarily structurally, but um, in terms of resilience like generators, three-phase power systems, those sorts of things? What's their plan there? Yeah, yeah, look, I work with the council here to look at some of these issues and, and where the pinch points would be. And you're definitely in a pinch point up at Amano because you could be quite easily cut off and cut off for some length of time. And what we're learning out of the, the East Coast and what's happened under the Gabriel Gabriel just highlights that exact uh, scenario. And it's a, it's a real moving science at the moment. So we're currently, um, we've been looked at some other options there um, that are solar based as well. So the, the, there's, we are, there is work in place. We are identifying issues and we're having, okay, we'll have um, dialogue with the community board to work out look, what is the, where are the most I shouldn't say important, but we're the, we're the sort of the pinch points that we need to identify first and then work back from there. Uh, Maramo is definitely a, a geographical area that could easily be cut off and cut off for some time and power is an option, so that's an option that we're looking at. So it's, it's work in progress. So you've got that in your annual plan, long term plan? Oh, look, I'm not qualified to talk probably to the, to the long term plan. Well, I think, but it's, I, I it's think we need to see that. Yeah, I can respond to that. Um, oh. Um, we, we're definitely looking at what we should be doing around uh, making sure that we're resilient for power, particularly to community halls, looking at solar power, but also what you're talking about for longer term, we do need to look at three phase. Uh, looking at what, how we use Starlink and uh, set phones and how they might be distributed around to make sure that we can continue with communications in such an event. So yes, absolutely working on it. Um, ask for a show of hands on who's local to Omaru, just the town. Um, show of hands. Yeah. And who's up the valley? Who's in Omaramo or Twizel? Anyone down from there? One or two? What about somewhere in between? Any other communities? Yeah? Palmerston, East, yep, East Otago, yep. Awesome. Okay, that's great to know. Thank you. So, what we saw, you know, often we see again and again. Uh, resilience is through things like having generators, having a, a, a ability as a community, there might be a hub in your community where you can have uh, generators. 
Um, I've seen examples, for example, of, uh, on the West Coast where you can pump petrol out of a petrol station if you've got the right technology to do that. So if you need fuel, which we all are going to need and there's going to be a shortage of fuel, um, being able to pump it out of the, of the gas stations when you don't have electricity is really important. And so they've been putting um, you know, the resources in place to enable that to happen. So there are lots and lots of examples of how we can build resilience um, and you know, the emergency management um, in the Waitaki is here to help you with that. And, but I would also say that you know, um, our emergency management partners, there are very few numbers in each of the regions. When, when we started this project in Otago, there were eight full-time staff as part of Otago's emergency management system. Everyone else is seconded in when there's an event. That number's now grown to, I think, something like 20 or 25 people in Otago. Um, and so th there aren't many uh, emergency managers out there. They're not going to come looking to look after you necessarily. You you're going to have to look after yourselves. And I think that's a really important message, that community resilience is about you and your neighbours and your, your uh, local communities working together to build your, your resilience with help and support from emergency management. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, so kind of following on from that, um, more and more people have solar panels that are tied into the grid, right? Mm -hmm. So how would that system be affected if, say, the dam, you know, generation goes out? Would that help improve the resiliency of mm -hmm. the immediate community by, by having that generation be more localized? Uh, absolutely. I think microgrid or the ability to generate local electricity definitely helps resilience because if you have solar and that means and, and it hasn't been disrupted by ground shaking, it means that you're going to still have power and that's that's a good thing. If 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 it's not actually, I'm not entirely sure about whether you need the grid to help you um, like use your solar power. I don't know. Maybe Brent knows that an answer to that. But so yeah, I would say that definitely having local. Uh, generation of power has, has got to be a good thing in the long run for New Zealand so I would encourage PVs and, and all of those um, those renewable energies to, to be rolled out much more so to local kind of communities and, and homes etc. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. just, just recently there, the council and I were talking to a company that sort of had already been looking at this space and that during the, the Gabriel on the East Coast they actually had to rolled out some of their um, products that they had and that they were solar powered and uh, they had inverters on them, they had water purification, they're running Starlinks. So it's really accelerated that, that ability to generate power because it was really, um, some of the issues with generators was getting them. Secondly was the transport of fuel because it's a, it's a, it's a problematic to transport fuel. So it is a space that we're exploring and, and it's growing incredibly fast, just like the, the Starlink type technology. Um, just where areas were cut off communication wise, we see one New Zealand, and I'd imagine the likes of companies like Spark will follow suit to doing a deal with um, SpaceLink, uh, which SpaceX rather, which is Starlink. So that'll mean your cell phones will have connectivity uh, throughout the, you know, just about anywhere at any time, because it wouldn't be affected by an incident like this. So it's a really moving space. But yes, the solar energy is something to really look at because you could be generating power. Uh, or, or you, and feeding into the grid in peacetime, or it might be something that could um, power up a community or centre or evacuation centre or welfare when needed. Yeah. Hi. Uh, can you please bring back one of the early slides, the one with the South Island map with the latitude and longitude, where you show the different. The latitude and longitude, did you say? Yes. Well, you, you and. Let's see. So tell me when you see it, because I'm not I sure. I will. <laughs> it's probably the number five. Oh, okay, we're going right there. Okay. Something. Because... That one? No, no, no. Even before that. Before that. Oh, the size of Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Go one. back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That one? No. Oh. <laughs> that one? No. That one. <laughs> there you go. That one, yes. Sorry. Now, if you look at Christchurch there, Yes. It has the same, how can I say, non-threatening <coughs> color than yeah. Homer. Yeah. And however, things happen. 
Absolutely, yeah. So I should I should qualify this by saying that this is the seismic hazard model back in 2010. So this is right before the earthquakes kicked off in Canterbury. There is a, an updated version of this model, but I just use this as an example of what it looks like. But yeah, really well spotted. Here we're seeing um, Christchurch and quite a chunk of Canterbury being sort of characterised as, as lower seismic hazard compared to the plate boundary, yeah. And so, um, you know, you might remember that the earthquake, that really, you know, the destructive earthquake um, around Christchurch was actually on a previously unknown fault, the Green Day Dale Fault and then the other fault, I can't remember its name, Helen, you know more about this than me, um, were, were, had not been mapped previously because basically evidence of those faults had been removed by the river systems, you know, taking, taking away any um, evidence of them. So yes, Christchurch was considered to be relatively low seismic risk at the time, much like Dunedin and Omaru. So it goes to show that, you know, we don't know all about all of the faults in New Zealand, but obviously the plate boundary is the biggest feature and the most significant hazard for us. Yeah. And may I bring up, I think that the key word is not a scientific, but a human word that you mentioned, which is complacency. Yeah. So we didn't see it coming and suddenly mm. it happened. Mm. Now that brings back, I don't know, technology and also, I don't know how to call it, business. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you in this context, all the information, all the science, from what you told me, is based on the research of mm -hmm. a handful of people yep. in one way or other. Mm -hmm. I'm not questioning. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that each of these research has a degree or a variation of certainty, uncertainty. Yes, that's right. On top of that, you build your models. On top of that, you advise, for example, the earthquake commission or the strengthening of all the buildings, mm -hmm. which becomes an economic model of the feasibility of anything. So, for Absolutely. example, I'm not sure if I want to buy property in Haast mm. <laughs> after I heard what you say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm extremely selfishly happy living in Wamara. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, and we have the mayor in the back, I now wholly heartedly support funding to maintain the airport. Mm -hmm. Because we don't use the airport, but the airport will be fundamental in order to everyone else mm -hmm. who is running from other parts and needs something to communicate because we won't have highways, we won't have power. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? I mean, I, I, I totally know, agree with My you. question is, where is the model? <laughs> where is the model? Well, look, I, I totally agree. Models are almost always wrong, um, but they give us some insights into uh, the future. And I think using a scenario-based planning approach like we've done is just the power of the hypothetical. It's based on the best science that we had available at the time. Um, and it gives you something to think about. What might the reality be for us? Um, when this earthquake happens. That's probably the best answer I can give. I mean, there's there's all sorts of different types of uncertainty and models, and that's another whole two or three lectures to, to talk through that. But for the for the, the purposes of this um, this work that we were trying to achieve, that scenario was perfectly fit, you know, fit for purpose, and it's, and it's done a huge amount um, to help build awareness and preparedness and stimulate a lot of activity across um, the planning and emergency management sector and communities as well. Yeah. Yep. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can. Sorry, this is more modelling questions, so hopefully that's okay. Oh, John, where people are amazingly scientific. <laughs> Great. Just yeah, a couple away. of questions. <laughs> um, so, with your south to north rupture modelling, what yeah. depth? was that done at? Mm. And obviously, if that varies, how would it affect us? Yeah. And the second question is, um, so pre-Canterbury earthquakes, they talked about seismic gaps along the Alpine Fault, mm -hmm. and there were some at, I think it was Fox or Franz Joseph. Are they still there, and are they yeah. where you think the yeah. next events may be? That's a really excellent question. So uh, the first one, um, oh gosh, Actually, I'll go for the second one first. So the, the seismic gaps, because I've forgotten the first one. <laughs> the seismic gaps, when I was talking about that work by Jamie Howarth um, on the lakes, so part of his sort of hypothesis was that there are, there are segments of the Alpine Fault, that it's not just all the same all the way along. There are, there are segments of it. And where one part of the, the fault works its way into the next segment of the fault, those act as barriers to the way that earthquakes move across the fault itself. And so... Um, part of his work suggested that we might actually have a, a scenario in future where there might be a smaller magnitude earthquake on one segment of the fault and it just stays within that part. It might be a magnitude 7 or 7.5 and, 
and, it, and it's, a more, it's, it's a smaller magnitude event. But if it manages to have enough, um, the magnitude's high enough to tip it across the, the boundary into the next part of the fault, then it's going to be a much more significant magnitude of 8.2 or, or greater. And so there was a bit more to that science, and I didn't go into the details tonight, but definitely there are segments of the fault. The other part of your question was the depth, I've just remembered. Um, and so what's called the, the seismogenic zone, in other words, where earthquakes are being generated below the surface, is somewhere between sort of 10 and 15 kilometres. And so that was, the model was based on, I think it was around 10 to 12 kilometres depth. Yeah, and that's quite a realistic sort of um, scenario for a future earthquake being generated there. Sorry. If it was deeper or shallower, do you yep. think we would be affected more significantly? Yeah, I mean, the shallower the depth, the more intense the damage and the shaking on the surface. And we saw that in Christchurch with just five kilometres below the surface for that earthquake. So, yeah, the shallower earthquakes are certainly the ones that we need to be more concerned about. Um, yeah. Yep. Another question? As an audience, um, it's probably not so important as what everyone else has been talking about, but um, could we, would we expect the amount of liquefaction that they got in Christchurch, or is mm -hmm. that dependent on different build-ups of yeah, types really of ground, or yep. that's the right way of putting it? Really good question. So, yeah, interestingly we heard from Brent about the what he called the PGA, which is that intensity, and it, and um, Actually, it's, it's not likely to, to produce liquefaction here on the East Coast. So we've done a, a South Island-wide model for liquefaction. And yeah, we wouldn't expect to see the, the level of liquefaction being produced on the East Coast. But there will be certainly pockets on the West Coast that experience significant liquefaction, around mainly around rivers, river margins, and dunes and, and beach areas around the West Coast, definitely. Um, so yeah, that's certainly something to think about. And you know, in terms of the, the messaging, we, we know the, the drop, cover, and hold message, don't we, about what to do when the earth's you know the ground shaking. There's also that long, strong, get gone message, which is really important, particularly if you're around rivers or lakes in the, in the alpine regions. You know, those that we also have this phenomenon called a seish wave, which is basically when you have a lake body and it's moving and it causes a sloshing. Of the, of the surface and the sloshing can actually cause quite an inundation of waves around lakes. So even, you know, like Tekapo and the lakes on the eastern side of the Alps, you need to be thinking about what, you know, what might be happening around the lake margins after an earthquake like this too. So that long, strong get gone message definitely is important to think about here as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sam, we've talked about models. Uh, <laughs> I know that um, in theory the dams are going to hold, but is there any projections to uh, if the water did come down in a hurry, where the water would be flooding through? I'll go back to Brent on that one. <laughs> I'll, I'll first give you the reassurance that we're going to keep the water and it won't be an uncontrolled release of water. Um, if we go back to our uh, PMF, so probable maximum flood, so we look at how the water would behave going down that chain. We, if, if anyone knows what a LIDAR survey is, that's just uh, working out the topography of the ground, so we know where the humps and hollows are. Uh, we can do some modelling there that releases some water at the top and you see how the flood paths um, operate. So we do that for um, probable maximum flood modelling. Uh, what we know is that the further you get down the Waitaki Valley, um, you people will know if you've been jet boating up the Wait uh, Waitaki River or that, there's quite steep terraces there. So we, um, from the modelling that we've done, um, the, the the, terrace, uh, the water level will rise up those terraces, but we don't have an expectation that that will spill over those terraces. So um, quite well contained within the, uh, the flood channels that you already have in those existing rivers. Um, when I talk about uncontrolled release of water, so we, there was the picture of that uh, dam break up there, but that was a, um, a dam that was made off a landslide. All of our dams are really well engineered. And you find globally that um, dams that are made of earth and concrete behave very, very well 
um, under these seismic conditions. So in an earth dam, you think about uh, its shaking, um, and, and the dam height will probably drop because everything's going to settle down a bit, but um, it can sort of morph around to actually um, block up and refill and reform. Uh, the, the main concrete dam that we've got is Waitaki, and um, it's a really cool dam. I mean, there's a lot of history tied up with that. But it, um, it behaves as an arch dam um, under a seismic load, so all the load is transferred to the left and right abutments. Um, so we, we know that that's going to bind up and be very strong. Um, and same with Avonmore. Avonmore is um, a half earth dam, half concrete dam, and we, we believe we know how that's going to behave as well. So um, reassure the room is, yeah, have the confidence that um, uh, we know what's going to happen with these dams under those maximum incredible earthquakes. And, and to give you an idea, um, uh, we started off uh, the Waitaki Valley Seismic Loads Assessment um, back in the 1990s. And we took 10 years to actually work out what those peak ground accelerations were at each of those sites. And at the time, that was the most seismically understood region, your region, your backyard, uh, in all of New Zealand. And then after the Christchurch earthquake and Kaikoura earthquakes, there's been a lot more study done um, uh, wider in New Zealand. So, so we've been thinking about this for a long time. Uh, when we did the modelling uh, to work out how the dam would behave at Waitaki, uh, that cost us in the order of about a million dollars. So there's a handful of people out there that can handle this computational mathematics to try and work out how these dams behave. There's only about uh, you know, a handful of people in the world, so you go and get a million dollar study done there, and everyone goes, well, was that right or not? Mm -hmm. So then you get a peer review done, and the peer review almost costs you about the same, mm -hmm. and then you've almost consumed all the, all the, the brains in the world around that. So mm -hmm. um, I'm just trying to give you the confidence that uh, we don't take that lightly. Um, I'm always wearing my black hat at work, because that's what I'm paid to do for Meridian. Um, and we put a significant amount of investment into actually understanding how they would behave um, under these really um, adverse conditions. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Thanks so much. Ben. We have a question over here. Yep. Far more simplistic on the modelling, perhaps, but Christchurch was under the radar ever since, mm. and um, in the Maori community, they were building Kaipoi. And in Tanuka, they never built it in Christchurch. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they had a knowledge of 700 years previous, which would have been one of those big earth quakes. So, yep. any consult with them, they will have perhaps something tucked away. Yeah, absolutely. That, that science or the matauranga of, um, of the period before European arrival, absolutely. Gosh, there's a lot of really interesting um, stories or pūraka about... Um, events that happen in the past, you know, tsunami events up around Marlborough and um, through the Marlborough Sounds and, and yeah, absolutely we should have learnt those lessons. In fact, you know, um, Christchurch before it was built on was described as the, the swampy ground, you know, across on the other side from the harbour, which, you know, they started to settle first and then the swampy ground was sort of, you know, they started building there when they needed to, I think, that's my understanding. But also we have had, there, there were earthquakes in Christchurch. 1888, 190-something, there were a series of damaging earthquakes in the early part of the 20th century that took the, spot, the steeple, the spire off the top of the cathedral, Christchurch Cathedral. So it, we just forget things, you know. These earthquakes were happening, but decades and, and you know, generations had gone by since the last ones that we no one could remember anymore. And so actually it wasn't really surprising that the top, or, you know, that the steeple came down because it had happened before. Yeah, we just don't tend to learn very le good lessons. In fact, there was a model made of um, of the liquefaction hazard in Christchurch uh, before the earthquake sequence started. And if you looked at that model and you looked at what happened in Christchurch, it was almost exactly predictable where the liquefaction um, happened. So, yeah, there's a lot more to be said about that. And Helen is the person to talk to afterwards if you've got questions. She's just down in the front row. Yeah. We've heard that we're not going to have electricity. So the other item that's pretty important is water. So for the council now with its scheme running from Omaru down to Meraki, what's the plan when the pipe gets broken? 
and in terms of being able to keep water coming to communities because it's very difficult to stay in your home without water. So if there's any responses for that? I can't specifically talk to um, for the council through waters, but I mean, water is a priority. You, know, you, you can live without food for quite some time, but you can't live without water. So from an emergency operation perspective, we'd have to get potable water into areas which would be high priority. So I can only speak from an operational point. I can't well, probably speak technically to the water infrastructure thing, but without saying it would become a priority, it would be say, overground pipes laid. Um, and there'll be a lot of learnings coming out of East Coast because they have a lot of infrastructure damage there. Um, so there's currently a lot of learnings coming from that, how to quickly restore some of those critical, in critical infrastructures. I mean, you can, I shouldn't say quickly, but reasonably quickly, uh, just over top of ground, sorry, over top of ground to lay and will connect water lines. Um, but it's, it's a complex and you, you don't know what you don't know. I mean, Dow Point Fault could impact a lot of other infrastructures or it could just sever a water pipe and you still have power and you just fix the water pipe and it's all go again. But it's definitely projects of work that have been looked at and it's, 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 it's the council's mandate to make sure that those um, lifeline utilities, if they are responsible for that lifeline utility, they've got legislative requirement to, to be able to restore it to, back to its uh, working state as quick as possible. Doesn't really answer your question, but that's, that's all I can probably offer at this stage. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just having your, you know, um, collecting rainwater in a tank is again, the sort of looking after your own household is really important in that respect, isn't it? Any more questions? You, you, you're doing amazingly well, Omru. I mean, if you feel like peeling off, don't feel bad about it if you need to be somewhere, but I'm happy to stay and answer as many questions. There's another one down the front here. Um, where's the mic there? Alana's busy. Where is she? Hopefully this will work. Oh yes, goodness. Um, just um, was. Oh, sorry. I'll be really quick. Um, just wondered if there is actually a, a list of emergency centres. If for, God forbid we actually need them, because we found it quite hard to find that. So that would be to you, if you could address that, please. Yeah, look. Depends on the area that you're in. It depends on the event that you're in. We've got we've got some pre-identified um, what we call hubs or centres or halls that we could open up, but those sort of uh, dependent on the event um, because they may or may not be suitable depending on what the event is but it's always an, an ongoing piece of work you're always working with the council you're always working the community board is some if you're in any in area that's got a community board they're, they're the ones that you should be working with to say hey look if we've got a gap if you've not got a gap or just directly make contact with me back in business time grab my card we have a conversation, so what's your community? Where's your area? Is there a gap? Have we got something identified for you specifically? If we haven't, can we address that? What do we need to do to address that? And we can just progress it from there. So it's just a constant piece of work. Um, for our tsunami zone mapping that you'll see on the site, we've identified some key points, but they, they could change. There could be spontaneous venues pop up just led by the community on any given day, and then we could support those. So that's just a, a constant piece of work. I know that, hope that answers your question, but quite happy to carry on this conversation after this um, to work with you or with your immediate community to address if there is an issue. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just uh, wondering if the council's looked into, uh, with Takaro Park just here, they, it used to be a swamp, and a flip of action happened up in Christchurch. Then, is that likely to happen here with our hospital sitting at the edge of it? Yeah, I, I guess it comes back to those local faults that might produce pretty decent shaking around the district. And in that case, yes, there probably would be lack of liquefaction. But as we were saying, you know, these earthquakes are much less likely so they're going to happen every few thousand years as opposed to every few hundred years so it's very low risk low risk of that happening yeah i the, the, the background to my question is that in the 19, 1970 i was working in london her all around the area there mm -hmm. i've seen the devastation of the earthquake and it took years to get it 
and to go up the Bola River, maybe just up the road, up through there, was impossible. Yeah. But part of the work I had to do was to go up on top of the ridge to the south of the Nangahua Bridge. And that ridge right along there is absolutely shattered. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting up there one day looking at it there, and we'd had heavy rain the day before, and the river was running high. And I often thought, what's going to happen if we have an earthquake? The river's running high. Mm -hmm. Is that whole hillside going to fall into there? Mm -hmm. Now, the other question I have is, what about the Haast, mm -hmm. um, Arthur's Pass, all the major rivers? Has research been done on the potential of blocking those rivers? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. In fact, a piece of work was just finished recently looking at landslide dams and, and their likelihood um, around South Westland. And yes, there are some significant hotspots around there. Um, the, the Eglinton Valley is one that's um, got a high likelihood of producing a landslide dam. It's a very big catchment. You know, if, if you know that valley, it's, it's a very, very big catchment. And so if one section of the river is dammed, there's a huge amount of volume of water that's likely to come down in behind that, um, which means that it's likely to be an unstable dam and over top, and there'll be a significant body of water that moves down the valley. So yeah, the answer is yes, there has been research done, and it is something that we need to be really aware of. So again, this messaging for communities, know your river. If you see it change significantly, if it suddenly, sort of, the flow drops away majorly, or uh, it becomes really turbid and dirty, then there's something happening up the valley and you want to keep well away from that and maybe even evacuate. But, but that's the sort of thing that will, because it's a, the Alpine Fault's going to produce very wide impacts over the west coast, it's unlikely that we'll know about those very quickly because there's going to be a lot of reconnaissance work needing to be done by you know, scientists, etc., to fly over and see where the issues are. So it's about the local communities understanding their river and how it normally behaves and reacting if it's looking a bit different or if there's something unusual happening, yeah. One other big question. What's, what's the possibility of uplift, the vertical uplift like uh, Yeah, so you're talking about the way the, the Alpine Fault might move the landscape. So I talked about quite a significant horizontal shift of around 10 metres and less likely to be vertical, but something like two or three metres of vertical in, in some areas, but it's less, less likely to be that kind of vertical as opposed to the horizontal movement here. Yeah. Can, I, can I just ask a question? Um, in the video that you showed, or the simulation you showed us of the earthquake, the South to North earthquake, yeah. the area around Timaru sustained an awful lot of energy mm. for an awfully long time. Yeah. And I presume that's the gravels or, or something similar. How would we in Omaru get our food supplies if the State Highway 1 and all that infrastructure in that area was, yeah. was totally wiped out. Yes, exactly. And this is what I was talking about before with um, supply chains being disrupted and dis you know the supply of goods you know being um, very severely di disrupted for months, if not years, after this event. So, you know, the Rangatata floods a couple of years ago, I don't know about you, but in Dunedin we weren't getting bread and bananas and other things because things, you know, supplies just dry up. And that's exactly what we'll experience after an earthquake like this. And so, again, it just, it just shows us that we're going to have to look after our local context, our communities, our neighbours and ourselves for a period of time until, until those supply chains are, are rebuilt, essentially. Yeah. <coughs> As people are drifting off, I just want to say thank you so much to those who have to leave, but again, more than happy to stay for, for, for others who want to carry on. Yeah. Hi, I also want to address what the gentleman just mentioned earlier about the rivers and the amount of material coming down. I actually attended one of these a few years ago in Twizel, and they talked about um, the amount of material that would come down as a result of all the landslides yep. and onto the Canterbury Plains, and that would be like decades of material coming yeah. down. As a result, a lot of the rivers would be breaking their banks and they wouldn't be able to be contained. So as much effort being put into understanding that or how you can mitigate that at all? Yeah, there's been quite a bit of work. Um, obviously with the very high rainfall on the west coast, there's a lot, that, that it'll be a much more dynamic shifting of, of material through that landscape. So um, there's been studies done on the 1717 earthquake in terms of the amount of material that was deposited on the, on the um, coastal strip. And it was metres of, of material in some places. And so 
you know, this is, you know, we, we often talk about the more immediate sort of one to two years of, of hazards and, and issues that we're going to face, but actually the landscape response to an earthquake like this will go on for decades. We'll have an aftershock sequence that goes on for decades, and we'll have movement of material through the Alps and through the river systems that goes on for decades as well. And so, you know, um, farmers on the West Coast, highly likely that rivers are going to change channel. There's going to be much more sediment coming out and inundating paddocks and things like that. So that's definitely um, going to happen. And on the East Coast, yeah, I mean, rivers may well change their course as well. But because there's less rainfall on the East Coast, it won't happen quite to the same extent as on the West Coast. But yeah, the, the amount of material, you know, and this again might be a question for Brent. You know, if you're getting a, a higher sediment load through rivers, how is that going to affect dams? You know, we, we hear about the clogging of dams when it comes to sediment intake. I don't know if you want to comment on that, Brent, but you know, that's something that we've. Um, I'm curious about actually. I'd like to ask you that question. <laughs> yeah, if that mic could be brought down here. Uh, yeah, what, what dams have effectively done is they've interrupted the natural flow of the river and then uh, through the re resource consent process and the consent conditions, uh, that's meant to replicate the natural environment before we can put the dams there. So um, dams are really good at um, holding silt and uh, sediment, so it sort of settles upstream of the dam. Um, we have some structures where we have low-level sluice gates, and they're actually called sluice gates, so you can open up and pass that sediment um, downstream. So, um, and our large uh, structures that are like the Benmore Spillway, um, the Aviemore Spillway, and the Spill Crest at uh, Waitaki, they will they will pass sediment down. So, um, we are trying to replicate what the uh, the natural environment uh, would do, but. Um, what we have the ability to do is to retain water so we can release it in a more controlled fashion so the, the consequence downstream isn't as big and flashy and as disruptive as what it may have been um, before the dams were put there. But we still have an obligation to try and replicate uh, what was there while it was coming out. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Very good. Any final questions? Yep, one more over there. Can you hear me? Um, this is going to be a, a bit of a wild card. Um, what's the likelihood of a, a similar tsunami event like there was in Japan mm. happening here in New Zealand, considering that we're sort of positioned on the tectonic plate similar to Japan? Yeah. Absolutely, excellent question. And um, you know, I, I talk a lot about the Alpine Fault, and it, it's a pretty bad scenario. But actually, the earthquake tsunami um, scenario for the Hikarangi margin, in other words, that subduction zone off the east coast of the North Island, is much worse. In fact, and my colleagues who communicate and do the science around that have a much harder time descri describing that because it's much more significant. And so, the Hikarangi margin, if if it's a, a major um, full length of the of the area on the eastern coast there, letting go the, the earthquake that we think might happen. That's a magnitude nine plus earthquake, and because it's happening off the coast and it's on the seabed and it's displacing water, it's uplifting a section of the coast of the seafloor rather. It's highly likely to generate a very destructive tsunami, and much like we saw in Japan, that tsunami is going to head west and into the, the coastline of the, um, the, the North Island and East Coast. So there's a lot of work going on, much like we're doing with the Alpine Fault, for communities on the East Coast to help them to understand their tsunami evacuation areas, the hikoi that they might do away from the coast, um, and to, see, to, to identify or to understand the natural signs um, and not delay the, the evacuation. So, you know, 30 minutes to spare, essentially, until the wave can hit some of those communities. And so people are getting this very strong message that don't go looking for your cat and, and going around the house trying to find the stuff you want to take with you. Have a go bag ready so that you can move quickly and land and uphill to um, protect yourself. So, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yes, that's right. Yes, please do. Can we get the mic to Helen down here, please?
Yeah, well, tsunami waves do, and Helen's the expert. I'm going to hand over. Um, yeah, I'm just to add on to that. So I, I do work for Environment Canterbury, so not specifically on my own, but um, I can speak on behalf of this part of Waitaki. Um, so we have actually recently done some tsunami modelling for the Canterbury coast, which comes down to the Waitaki River. Um, and one of the particular scenarios we looked at was the Hikarangi, and it. It will, you, it will arrive um, on this part of the coast, although it probably won't inundate a lot of the area. It's not going to be a, you know, a huge uh, tsunami coming in for um, the likes of Omaru or Waitaki Coast. Um, but it will still probably um, inundate parts of the beach um, in this area. But you're probably looking at... I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. It was about, I think, two and a half hours travel time um, from the earthquake happening to it getting to the Waitaki River mouth and that modelling that we did. So you're looking at, you know, for Omaru, probably just over two and a half-ish hours or three, yeah, sort of two, well, what should I say, about three hours-ish, I would say. Um, and that earthquake, like Caroline said, will be really enormous and you will feel it here. So it might not be very strong, but it will be a very long earthquake here. So, and you will, uh, there will be warnings in that sort of scenario because of the time frames that we've got. So, like Caroline was saying, for the east coast of the North Island, they don't have very long to respond to that earthquake and that tsunami that will arrive on that coast. You've got a few more hours here, um, so there will be warnings. Um, but you should, you will feel the earthquake and you should still evacuate your tsunami evacuation zones, which I'm sure of. Um, <laughs> you and can tell you where they are. Um, can I just say one other thing, Caroline? Mm. Um, just on the, you raised a really, really interesting point. I should move away from that speaker. Um, the man down the front about the um, Christchurch being in a kind of okay looking green area. Um, it's a pretty trickly coloured map, actually. <laughs> the new seismic hazard model has different colours that don't include green or blue. Um, and I guess one way of looking at that, that model, interestingly, it did include a magnitude 7.2 earthquake somewhere under the Canterbury Plains that could happen. So the model that you saw did include a big earthquake in Canterbury, just with a very long time, you know, a very long return period. And it was just sort of bad luck, actually, that Christchurch um, was where it was, when it was. It's kind of like, I mean, and I don't like to use a, a cancer analogy, but it's sort of like saying, well, if you want to reduce your cancer risk, you can do X, Y, Z, and that will reduce your overall risk. But anyone can still keep a cancer, mm -hmm. even if you do all those steps. So it's sort of like a, um, you're... Uh, that map that Caroline showed is just a statistical, yeah, and we can get earthquakes anywhere yeah. in New Zealand, it's just that in some places they are more likely than others, mm -hmm. and in some places you should be less surprised than others to experience an earthquake, and so along the Alpine Fault you would be less surprised. Um, but you can still get them yeah. here, it's but just they don't happen as often. And if you looked at all of our seismic hazard and compared it to Australia, all of us, our whole country is high, you know, seismic risk compared to the Australia, which is much less because it's not on a plate boundary, it's right in the middle of a plate, so it's much less seismically active. So, you know, relatively speaking, we have high seismic risk right across the whole country. Yeah. Um, I've got a question relating to the Hikarangi Fault. Yeah. If it goes and we do get a tsunami down this coastline, given the amount of coastal erosion that's going on at the moment, mm -hmm. What is the like likelihood of the strength of that tsunami to carve further out of this coastline? Mm. And the other one, we have a trench, a rather deep trench of the coast, about 35 k's I think it is. Mm -hmm. Is there a likelihood of a collapse being mm. induced from the release of the pressure of the Hikarini Vault? Mm. In which case we could be prone to quite a substantial tsunami if that happened. Oh gosh, yeah, I mean again, um, really interesting question, and we're we're learning more and more about the way the these the sub you know the underwater how things are happening. For example, in the Kaikoura earthquake with the canyon, you know, there's a very deep and steep kind of drop off off the Kaikoura coast. 
um, the landslides that went into the, the coastline there, some of that sediment made its way right up onto the east coast and they reported deposits of those sediments moving right through that ocean system up to the northeast. And so, um, yeah, absolutely, coastal inundation is a thing and it might erode away some vulnerable areas. But conversely, you can have uplift related to these things. So actually in the Kaikoura earthquake, um, sections of the coast were uplifted by several metres. So they've actually built a bit of resilience into their future because they've actually got a higher coast and um, when they were building back the, the road on State Highway 1, they had more material and more land to actually work with because it had been brought up five or six metres at some of those places. So, um, yeah, la the, the land surface can actually rise up, but it can also drop away, and it just depends on the nature of the event. Yeah, hope that answers your question. Yeah, there's another one. Um, I'm just wondering, the state of science at the moment, is there any sort of push for better predictability closer to an event mm -hmm. going on anywhere in the world, yeah. say in Japan or mm -hmm. the west coast of, uh, east coast of America, yeah, really where science is trying to ascertain you know, an event mm -hmm. much, yeah. much closer rather than a 50 year or a yeah. 100 year? Absolutely. So really great question. And I think, first of all, prediction of earthquakes is still not possible, but there is science going on to, to try and understand the very subtle or precursory things that might happen before an earthquake. So for example, on our own Alpine Fold, about five or ten years ago, they managed to get a big international um, collaboration, science um, collaboration uh, to drill down into the Alpine Fold. It was called the Deep Fault Drilling Program. And they, they were trying to uh, drill right down through the Alpine Fault and then instrument the hole by putting down um, special monitors and things like that, um, seismometers and other geophysical kind of data to collect. And they managed to put some, they did manage to get quite far down, but they didn't manage to go right through the fault because it was very difficult drilling and they're quite broken. Um, you can imagine down there it's quite broken up rock and it was difficult drilling conditions. What they did discover was geothermal water temperatures, so they found hot boiling water right down, you know, several hundred metres below the surface, which was interesting. Um, but in doing that, they managed to put some instruments down, which were sending data back to Wellington and their colleagues at Victoria University, trying to understand um, whether there was any change in temperature or pressure or anything um, before we might have an event. Now, unfortunately, a lot of that material was completely obliterated by a big flood that happened right where all that monitoring equipment was positioned and it took out a whole lot of it, so that's no longer there. But another piece of work that's been happening lately, again by the same team at Victoria, is putting seismometers right along the Alpine Fault at 10, meter, 10 kilometer intervals, right along the fault. This is an incredible piece of work and they're actually just out on the west coast right now Unfortunately, having to take those seismometers away, they were in place for two years and they've been collecting data on micro seismicity over the last two years. Um, it's very sadly for New Zealand, they didn't have the, the funding available to keep those seismometers there, um, which is a real tragedy actually, because you know um, the Alpine Fault is globally renowned, um, this incredible plate boundary fault. Um, we, we need those sorts of um, science investments happening so that we can know as much as possible about it. Um, but anyway, they're currently dismantling that network, but they did collect some really valuable data which hopefully will help us understand a bit more about the nuance and the way that the Alpine Fault's actually humming along with micro seismicity um, and it's really interesting science, so hopefully some more um, will come out on that in, in time. Oh yeah, sorry, yeah, so part of that collaboration in Japan, um, they are doing offshore drilling down into their own subduction um, zone, so they're trying to do a similar piece of work over there. I think they've, they've got more money obviously, so they, I'm not sure exactly what they've discovered, but you know, we're trying to find out what is, what might, um, and retrospectively after an event, what did they see? What were some of those geophysical kind of signals that might have um, occurred that help, might help us with prediction in future? But at this stage, we're still not really any closer to being able to predict earthquakes. <coughs> Sorry? Uh, my question is not really about the earthquakes, but more about how do people in Omaru find out where they would 
be more likely to try and go to mm -hmm. if there is an earthquake because obviously these things happen just like that so you can't drop pamphlets in the yep. thing and say you can be tomorrow and I can go to here mm -hmm. so are the council doing something in the way of letting Omaru people know where there would be possibly places they could go to if that occurred yeah a absolutely I mean that's a piece of what we're doing all the time and, and and, and, and probably the, the hard piece of work is making sure that we reach every individual like yourself. So, you know, that's why there's that importance to have your own household preparing this plan first. And if you, if you work through that plan and then you can identify, are you in, because you, you'd shelter in, in, in place if you could. So you might identify that your place is, is not in a tsunami zone. If it's not been impacted by the earthquake, there's no need to go anywhere. The safest place is home. And then if, if, if it is in an area that could be identified that could be affected by a tsunami, that's when you need, to, in your own household plan planning, is work out, well, is there family or friends I could go to? And if that's exhausted, that's when you, you know, look at what potential areas could be opened up by council or how would you be notified or how could I make contact? And that's something, look, if you, we, we, can, we can explore beyond this um, meeting tonight. So if you, that doesn't completely answer the question, just grab one of my business cards, give me a call tomorrow and we can follow that further, and I can just run you through that. And, uh, but really, that's, that's the importance of having that household planning. So you can identify all these things before these events happen, whether it be, it doesn't have to be earthquake, it could be just a, yeah, your adverse events, your weather events, similar to what's happened up in the North Island recently, is your, your place could be impacted by a, a weather event. So what does that mean? You know, do you, is it you to shelter at home, or do you need to move? If you need to move, where can you move to? Have you got pets? Do you need to take ID? So on and so forth. So that, that's, that's that getting right back to the very beginning of um, looking after yourself first, having that household preparedness plan.